Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Tim. Um, firstly, I didn't expect to get shit canned in the earlier speeches by Tony and Adam, so I'm glad that I'm second so I can uh, answer those. Um, a housekeeping issue before I get started. One other thing, Tim, was five in a row, not just five Movembers, so those that are interested. Um, so before we get started, and I'd hope someone else was going to do this, but I'm going to do it because it hasn't been done and it needs to be done. I was only asked to write this speech today, so I need to read a little bit of it and some of it I'll ad lib. But um, Jules, I'm going to start with you, if I can. Um, having, to, having, having gotten to know you fairly well over the, over the past couple of years, it dawned on me, with your semi-good looks and okay personality, there was potentially a long list of suitors that may have tried their luck with you before Heath arrived on the scene. This, of course, is nothing to be embarrassed about. We've all got needs. But now that the wedding nuptials are finally out of the way, this is the opportunity to wipe the slate clean and move into the new, next exciting chapter of your life with your new husband. So with that in mind, and without prejudice, I'd invite any former flames of Julie's that are here tonight that still have a key to her apartment to please come forward and place it in this bucket. Is that all? <laughs> wow, not a surprise. <laughs> uh, now, given we all know that Heath is only really roughly a 5 out of 10, um, to be fair, I should ask the same question. So if there happen to be any ladies in the room tonight that also have a key to Heath's apartment, now's the time to return them. I do have a couple. Uh, ladies. Two. Three. Three. Okay. Um, some housekeeping. Um, I was asked to remind everyone that if there are any injuries um, from people standing on chairs and tables during my standing ovation, Heath and Julie uh, hold themselves in no way accountable. Um, this isn't my first speech. It does sound, sound like my first speech. I'm a bit nervous. Um, but as people that know me know, I've done speeches at weddings before, funerals, openings. Um, but of all the speeches I've done, uh, this one is special. And I mean it's special because it's different. I was asked to do this, as I said this morning, and I had all day to think about it. And this speech is special to me because of all the speeches I've ever done, this is the most recent. I'm going to start at the beginning. It was an unseasonally cold evening on Friday, November 10, 1978. Frank and Jan had just finishing watching, finished watching episode 1.4 of Prisoner, in which Vinegar Tits was out to get Doreen Anderson and old hag Lizzie Birdsworth for enticing the prison electrician Eddie Cook into amorous encounters around the prison grounds. At the completion of that episode, Jan wasn't going to settle for a simple peck on the cheek. No sir, so they went for it. Nine months later, out popped Heath, with his little freckled face and his bright red hair. I can only imagine the joy Frank and Jan have had watching this little baby develop into the person he is today, only with a full-size freckled face and the same shit red hair. I've taken the liberty from here on of memorising the rest of this speech, so I'm going to give it a go. Um, the idea of flicking through 46 double-sided pages for the next 93 minutes I thought was going to detract from uh, the content, so I've done that. And I kept it to 46 pages because 46 pages was all that I had in the, uh, in the printer. And knowing the, uh, the, the, uh, the rate of uh, modern-day marriages surviving, I wasn't keen to go and buy another ream. <laughs> so here goes. Fornication. 
Sorry. For an occasion. <laughs> For an occasion as special as a wedding, I thought that it was important to ensure that a speech was engaging and entertaining. So any time that the family was out and I had the house to myself, I turned to the internet. Indeed, I found a lot of great material online that certainly wasn't available as freely during my teenage years that would have been of great use. But as we all know, good things come to an end, and as soon as I heard that car pulling back into the driveway, it was straight back to speech ideas following a quick deletion of the browser history. <laughs> now, one might assume that uh, researching a and piecing together a best man's speech sounds like an easy task, and you're right. I've done it before, and it was simple as Googling best man speech and taking a pic of hundreds of videos and how-to guides of the readily available to you, just so you can get that right on the big night. That said, the problem here is that I'm not actually the best man. It's hard to believe, I know. With our history, my charm and good looks, I still wasn't trusted with the rings of the church, nor did I get a seat next to the groom at the first supper. As we all know, the actual documented best man tonight is Heath's brother, Adam. And for those... And for those that agreed that Googling a speech and pulling it together is a simple task, it became clear that it wasn't that simple for Adam, who evidently didn't think to do that before selfishly halting the drink service for 25 minutes earlier tonight. <laughs> now, I'm not bitter at all about not being best man. The title, <laughs> the title of best man doesn't actually carry any significance, because we all know that if Adam was actually the best man tonight, he'd be sitting down there next to Julie, watching Heath give a speech about him and her. <laughs> so having wrongly assumed that Adam was going to use all the best jokes from the internet, I was unfortunately left to Google the evidently far less popular second best man speech. <laughs> and let me assure you that the results from that search were sweet fuck all. <laughs> so having gathered no internet advice on wedding speeches, it dawned on me at 1pm today, what person better to ask then the hang on, sorry. What person, what better person to ask for wedding speech advice than somebody that had seen more weddings than anyone I knew and happened to be right in front of me at the church as Heath was asking the groomsmen if they thought Julie would show up. <laughs> so I marched up to the altar and said, Father Peter, do you have any advice for a second best man speech? <laughs> Father Peter rocked back on his, on his heels in his flowing dress looked me straight in the eyes and he said, Barry, I said, my name's Tim. That's not important, he said. Barry, a second best man speech at a wedding needs to be like a miniskirt. Short enough to keep people interested, but long enough to cover the important parts. He then took a long swig from the cup of Christ, turned on his heels and walked away. Now that was the only advice I received for this speech before getting in the limo today to start writing it. Bit parched. <clears throat> now back to the lucky couple. And this is the only sincere part of my speech tonight, so <laughs> absorb it. For some lucky people, there comes a moment in their lives when the stars align and they meet that special someone that doesn't judge, doesn't criticise, and compliments them in every single way. A person that you can tell anything to and you know it will go no further. A person that you never grow tired of and you know will be in your life for the rest of your days as you grow old. That day arrived for Heath when he met me 21 years ago. <laughs> we, met at work, we met at work in meeting room five on February 4th, 2000, where we were both sent to collect our, he collect our headsets to enable us to take abuse from customers without developing RSI. As if it was fate, today is our 21st anniversary, anniversary which I suspect is no coincidence. The truth about the start of Heath's career is that he wasn't the preferred candidate for that role. He was the only one in a long list of candidates that had cricket listed as a sporting interest on his CV. The stars aligned that day because, as luck would have it, there was still one player short in the company cricket team for the fast approaching corporate games, and Heath was immediately available, so that sealed the deal. It was a simpler time where the Nokia 3210 was the phone to have. Snake and Minesweeper were the only games available to be played on your phone. You paid for text messages per character and the music charts were rightfully dominated by Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera. <laughs> I've now been one of Heath's second best friends for 21 years. <laughs> and it really is an honour to be here tonight giving this speech. We've spent so much time together over the years, I really do see him as a brother. 
And when I say brother, I mean brother like Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger were twins. <laughs> and it goes without saying that I'm not Danny DeVito. <laughs> we've done a lot. Uh, we've seen Pearl Jam over 30 times in five different countries and have travelled many other between tours. Nothing's too hard for Heath. I don't recall us ever having an argument. He's one of the most casual, relaxed and genuine people I've ever met and I'm proud to be considered his second best friend. <laughs> Heath's confidence is second to none. In the last 21 years I've seen him perform in front of, in front of large crowds at both Bogan Bingo and on a corporate level. During all the time I watched with amazement that this guy that had no physically redeeming features <laughs> still managed to hold the attention of a crowd and never showed any signs of nerves, ever, until this morning. There I was at 7am this morning, having just returned home from my daily 25 kilometre run, ocean swim and gym session, finishing off my protein shake when the phone rang. It was Heath. I could tell something was wrong, his tone was off, something seemed wrong. He was panicked and I started the, the line of second best friend questioning to try and get to the bottom of it. I pressed him for the specifics, he started to question, I questioned why on earth he would be nervous and he said, I've got a problem with the speech. I said, what's happened? Does Tony upset you? No. Teresa? No. Couldn't get to the bottom. I said, Heath, just come out with it. What's the problem? I can't understand your handwriting, he said. <laughs> I thought to myself, it was that important. He should have gotten his best man to write the speech instead of the runner-up. <laughs> now, as most of you know, Heath and Julie have been living in sin for the past couple of years. <laughs> having moved in together before the big day. Uh, Heath told me that he was going to break the news to Tony and Teresa in person, and since the announcement, the relationship between the Italians and the Germans hasn't been that strained since the 1943 occupation. <laughs> but since then, it appears that Tony and Teresa have become accepting of the crowd joining the ties. so much so that Tony was kind enough to arrange golf for the first Bucks party down in his very own home course, Moona Links. Thank you, Tony. I've had to ad-lib here. Now, I did listen with interest earlier as Tony covered off his sporting prowess in his speech, but I can't let that go unnoticed. Yes, Tony won a couple of games of pool after losing dramatically at golf earlier in the day on his home ground, but the circumstances surrounding those wins should be known. Big Tony rolled up to a group of blokes that had been drinking solidly for three days. He gained their confidence by filling them with homemade salami, wine and homegrown tomatoes and then challenged him to a sport of extreme hand-eye coordination to exhibit his sober skills. This is true. <laughs> now, this wasn't my first rodeo. I knew how important it was to Heath that Tony felt like he fit in on that weekend away. So ahead of Tony's arrival, I pulled the team together and I reminded them that Tony was in the construction game and probably the mafia. <laughs> so if there was anyone here that was going to bring shame to the family, they could expect to be part of Tony's next building foundations or find themselves being on one of, his, one of his many fishing ships being fitted out for a special set of concrete shoes. <laughs> the simple instruction given on the night that anyone that has to play Tony must use their opposite hand. <laughs> and that's how it went down. It's worth noting too that Tony was suspiciously unavailable for the second bucks to, exhi to exhibit his ability at bowling. We all know that he was too aware that there was only so much alcohol that everyone could consume before the day commenced and finished and he knew he was no chance so he ran for the hills. <laughs> Just while everyone's here I'm declaring that if I don't show up to the pub tomorrow for lunch for the post-wedding drinks, Tony's put a hit out on me. <laughs> Now, Julie's not Heath's first girlfriend, nor, nor is she the second, nor is she the third, or even the fourth. In fact, during my time of knowing Heath, the turnover rate of girlfriends has been higher than that of a call centre in Mumbai. <laughs> Having recently... Hang on. Look at that. Having... Where am I? Sorry. Uh, yeah. having, having recently reviewed my list of Facebook friends, I realised that Heath, Heath's ex-girlfriends actually accounted for 157 of my 230 total friends, and that's 
And it may come as a, as a surprise to people in this room that Jules and I are not actually Facebook friends, and apologies, Jules, if that's seemed cold over the years. Um, it's just that I couldn't bring myself to get too attached, knowing the odds of you becoming my 158th shit friend that I don't care about. <laughs> I do regularly see you pop up in suggestions, and after three years of putting up with, uh, three years of you putting up with Heath, I was still confident that today you might change your mind. <laughs> the last thing I wanted was that 158th friend to be courtesy of Heath, and now that we're all here and we're through the ceremony, the likelihood is that Heath will be passed out during the legal annulment period. So I'm happy to invite you tonight, Julie, to be my Facebook friend number 231. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean I'll accept, she said. You'll accept. <laughs> Ange and I have been friends for ages. <laughs> We're nearly done. <laughs> Whilst on media platforms, I think it's worth calling out the truth about how, and, how Julie and Heath met. Most of you know it was on Tinder. Um, I recall it well. It was a Thursday night. Heath was at our place for a few drinks like we did each week. We got talking about Tinder. And myself, as somebody that had been off the market for over 25 years, <laughs> sorry ladies, <laughs> I was fascinated with the concept of not needing to leave your lounge room to secure a date. What a time to be alive and how far we'd come from the Nokia 3210. <laughs> I asked Heath if I could use his Tinder, Tinder account to see what it was all about. He obliged, as long as I agreed to stick to his golden rule. He said, I don't care how many ugly ones you swipe right for, but under no circumstances are you allowed to swipe left on any of the good-looking ones. That night I must have swiped right on over a thousand ladies, of which one was Julie. <laughs> it was like trolling for salmon in anticipation of pulling out of the net the next day to see what I'd caught for Heath. And I'm glad we landed you, Jules, on that night. I'll leave it to this group to decide which side of his rule Julie was on. <laughs> Jules, you deserve the best, and nobody could accuse you of settling for second best here tonight. Those that know Heath would agree he's about 20 places behind second. <laughs> what does the future hold? For those unaware, Heath and Julie have just purchased a new home which they are about to begin renovating into their forever home. I suspect that as a result, over the next 12 months, over the next 12 months it'll be jam-packed with nothing but banging, screwing and pounding in each and every room, all day and all night. So I wish them well. <laughs> I believe Sally sells a lubricant now to address any drywall issues you might come up against. <laughs> it's late, I know. Uh, I'd like to give a big thank you to the bridesmaids tonight, Enza, Natalie, Sue and Nikki, as you've all done a fantastic job in convincing Julie to show up today. Uh, it goes without saying that you all look lovely and you're only eclipsed by Julie herself, who I'm sure you would go and agree that she's at least a solid 7 out of 10. <laughs> 11 out of 10. It says 11, I said, so I ad libbed that to us. On behalf of myself and the other groomsmen, Adam, Paul, Anthony and Ryan, as well as the rest of the guests here tonight, I'd like to say congratulations to you both. Um, wish you very well for the best years of marriage ahead. Uh, before I get to the toast, I'd like to thank all the guests on behalf of the bride and groom and sharing this very special occasion. I know that Heath and Julie will never forget it, but personally and selfishly, it would have been easier if we had all just stayed home today. <laughs> As I mentioned, I started this at 1.30 today and I feel like I've been delivering it just as long, uh, but you can relax. If I could ask everyone to please be upstanding. There's a visual gag here. I'd like to raise a toast. <laughs> to the most important people here tonight, the bar staff. Thank you.